Yo vine por eso, por tener un futuro, ya dejar todo el sufrimiento que hemos pasado. Hoy se tiene previsto otra caravana que llegue a la frontera de Guatemala con México. Everybody wants to go through Mexico. They don't want to stay in Mexico. Vamos a llegar a otro lado y vamos a estar mejor. Solo porque seamos migrantes no quiere decir que somos delincuentes. The caravan is a way to avoid deadly criminal violence. Pues sí sé que es delito, pero cómo lo vamos a sacar el dinero para comprar la ropa de los chamacos. The problem is ultimately political. What agencies are responsible for fighting crime? And the answer is no one. This is a country where 98% of crimes are never solved. We all have the right to find something better. No hay mucho de qué sobrevivir, de qué mantenerse. Es lo que hay y es lo que tienes que hacer. Cuando tus amigos son asesinados, aparecen, la gente empieza a organizarse con los medios que tiene. Y ojalá espero que cambie mi vida. ¿Tienen miedo? Sí. Ya no va a quitar. Aquí en nuestro país desaparecen 13 personas a diario. El gobierno no busca a nuestros familiares. Este es el cráneo. Este muchacho tiene un balazo en la cabeza y está amarrado. Por la posición que cayó el muchacho, al, al pararlo ahí, le dan el balazo y él cae de frente. En Iguala y sus alrededores encontramos más de 3,000 fragmentos de huesos o huesos enteros tirados en los cerros. Sería un milagro, ¿no?, que mis hijos aparecieran con vida. No se puede vivir con un dolor así. ¡Porque vivos se los llevaron! ¡Vivos Hemos tenido que encarar al gobierno mexicano, que lejos de darnos verdad, pues nos reprime, nos miente. ¡Guerrero no está solo, venimos a apoyar! ¡Pero qué lamentable! ¡Se toparon! ¡Pero el beso con tremendo que fue haber que encontrado! ¡Mientras que las autoridades han quedado por los suelos por su gran irresponsabilidad! Quienes deberían de cuidarnos nos están desapareciendo y matando. Ayotzinapa es un caso emblemático para el país. Ayotzinapa demostró lo que mucha gente grita, pero nadie le hace caso. A los muchachos de Ayotzinapa los desapareció el Estado en sus tres niveles de gobierno, municipal, estatal y federal. ¡Ya mataron a uno! ¡Ya mataron a uno! ¡Hablen de la ambulancia! No es nada grato ver caer a un compañero, ver cómo se llevan a otros compañeros y tú no poder hacer nada. Lo que no queremos es que se vuelva a repetir porque lo peor que puede uno vivir como ser humano, tener un hijo desaparecido es casi perder la vida misma porque ya no tiene una paz. The problem is ultimately political and has to do with accountability. Who is responsible for what? What agencies are responsible for fighting crime? Who is accountable by the system? And the answer is no one.
La verdad es que llevamos años sufriendo una violencia que ninguna autoridad puede detener. Cuando tus amigos son asesinados, cuando tus familiares desaparecen, cuando las personas que quieren alimentar a sus familias son extorsionadas y nadie hace nada, la gente empieza a organizarse con los medios que tiene. Sabemos que son los dos grupos de policías, autodefensas o, o comunitarios que están como peleándose el territorio. El grupo criminal de los Dumbo estaba aquí. Los Dumbos iniciaron con la venta ilícita de gasolina, pero pues eso no me incomodaba a nadie. Pero después andaban ya haciendo atropello con el pueblo. Se presume que a los cocodrilos pues, le daban carne humana, no es nada confirmado. ¿eh? Este problema empezó desde que este delincuente que se vino a vecindar trató primero de someter a la gente, por miedo la trató de unir a su grupo. No me pueden decir que me van a desarmar a mi gente para ponernos en manos de Ernesto Gallardo. Ya llegó la Policía Federal, llegó la Marina, llegó el Ejército. Tienen rodeada la comisaría donde está la policía de la POEC. Cuando nosotros le atacamos a los Zumbo, el gobierno, la marina, viene por nosotros, porque le estamos afectando el interés de los Zumbo. Pero es el pueblo que se encarga de parar al gobierno. Nosotros estamos bloqueando porque vienen a desarmar a nuestra policía comunitaria. Welcome, welcome, welcome once again to the Radical Imagination. I'm your host, Jim Bredos. I'm a sociologist who's taught at John Jay College of Criminal Justice and Yeshiva University here in New York City. In the spring of 2018, immigration fears reached a fever pitch in America with stories of a caravan on their way to the U.S. border from South and Central America. As thousands of families, mainly from El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, crossed the southern U.S. border to seek asylum, the Justice Department ordered the arrest of anyone entering the country without authorization. They forced the separation of hundreds of families, even the removal of infants from nursing mothers. To scare people from bringing their families over the border, Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General at the time, said, we need to take away children It made no difference how young they were. Trump and his administration set the spin machine full blast, falsely stating that the caravan had been orchestrated by Democrats or Venezuela and included criminals, rapists, MS-13 gang members, terrorists, and unknown Middle Easterners. Trump tweeted, go into the middle of the caravan, take your cameras and search, okay? Search, you're going to find MS-13, you're going to find ISIS, you're going to find Hamas, Hezbollah, you're going to find everything. I'll bring out our military, not our reserves. I've alerted the Border Patrol and military that this is a national emergency. We must change the laws. National and international outrage over this cruelty led the administration to rescind their family separation policy, but still asylum seekers were forced to wait for days and weeks in long lines just for a chance to approach the border to ask for protection. Much of the media has done a poor, poor job of helping us understand the migrant crisis, and many have only added to the misinformation and confusion about it. Most Americans have very little, if any, real knowledge and experience about their lives and the desperate missions and measures they've taken to survive and try to come here. We're pleased and honored to welcome to the Radical Imagination show today, Nick Question, the co-director of one of the most important, intelligent, and riveting films of our time that does throw light on the historically complex nature of the immigration and migrant crisis. 
We see the failed policies, political corruption, and economics that drive both immigration and narco trafficking in Mexico. In the film, we see the caravan primarily from the hearts and souls of those on the southern side of the border, how life south of the border has evolved into its current hostile state and the U.S. involvement in it. We see it up close and intimately through the experiences of people like Ludi, a 17-year-old girl with no family who is a rape victim in Guatemala and is traveling with her boyfriend in the caravan for protection. We see it through this, the long and, and perilous journey of Sarah and her large family of kids, ranging from teenagers to toddlers, desperately fighting for their survival. The film is called Blood on the Wall, and we're blessed to have the co-director, Nick Quested, here to discuss this terrific and important movie. So, Nick, thank you so much for being here to discuss your incredible movie. I've seen it now a couple of times, actually, the last couple of days. Uh, it's, it's, it's mind-blowing, it's riveting, it's passionate, it, it's, and, and it's, it's intelligent. It, it opens up so many questions of, of so many complex issues, and um, I'm just very, very pleased that you're here with us today. Well, thank you for having me. Great. So, so Nick, let, let's start out. How did it seems like when you watch the movie, you are you seem to be embedded in this caravan? How did this all get started? How did you uh, get started with this with this idea with this creative process? Well, we wanted uh, we we started the process with National Geographic about making three films in the region. So I spent uh, quite a lot of time in Venezuela and quite a lot of time in Nicaragua during the hundred days of protest. Uh, but eventually it was too much. We wanted to focus on one country and we felt Mexico was the most um, uh, pertinent for American audiences. So we always wanted to you know, tell the political and social history of Mexico, but it's impossible to separate the politics of Mexico from the politics of migration and the politics of narcotics. So we had initially planned to follow um, you know, a variety of different families and unaccompanied minors um, um, from southern Mexico or from the border all the way north. But as we were just beginning to shoot, the caravan was forming. So we basically rushed and pivoted to follow the caravan from Guatemala all the way to um, Tijuana. And we basically had a crew. It was between three of us, three principal direct producers who, um, followed the caravan all the way up. We always had someone on the caravan at some point for the whole time. It, did I hear you correctly? Is it, so this was the first of, of three films that you're trying to... Uh... No, no, I don't think we're going to... I don't think the other ones are going to come to fruition. Um, so, but it was planned to be three films and we ended up making three specials and we ended up making one. Okay. And this is... Uh, National Geographic has put this yeah. out. And it's just come out, right? September 30th. It yeah, just on. came out. Just came out. Did very Wonderful. well. Okay, terrific. And, and we'll talk a little more about how people can see it at, 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 uh, later on in the show. Um, so you're following the caravan. You're trying to intersect so many different issues. The war on drugs, which disproportionately, you point out, has really affected Central America uh, incredibly. You're talking about the political corruption of the country, uh, uh, the the drug cartels, the militarization of the police, um, and something, of course, that Americans don't want to face and we're not really exposed to very much here, is our own involvement, the corporations, the, the banks that laundered the drug money, and our collusion with political leaders that stand in the way of, of so many millions of people having just a, a, a decent lives. So, um, and then you do this also with such poignancy as you focus on, as you say, um, uh, particular individuals and, and, and families, and you, you show it at this personal level as well. Um, so, so tell me how you try to connect all of these. Well, we, can, we connected the, the story by using Mexico as a, the journey through Mexico as a chronology. So 
it's interesting because many of the events that of uh, the work for us, like the chronology of Actial, which was a massacre of 38 people, um, was in 1998. And so it, it's interesting how as they move up through the country, they reach nexus points that are appropriate for the chronology, whether it be um, uh, when they're in uh, Sinaloa or Guadalajara or Mexico City. So they, it was, it, 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 the, the path of the caravan dovetails nicely into a chronology of Mexico. So the topology, the, um, so basically we, we found these nexus points, whether it be Mexico City, Chiapas, Guadalajara, or the border, because in the end, everything goes to America and everyone wants to go to America. That's a great point. Uh, right. Uh, it, it's repeated over and over in the, in the film, uh, the desperation uh, that I don't think we understand here in this country at all. The desperation leads people uh, to make this incredible journey or try to get in. Um, I, hope, and, uh, I hope people would be more sympathetic to the plight of migrants yes. after seeing that, after sort of experiencing it themselves in a sense because of either the fires in California or the pandemic in the cities of particularly the Northeast, where you can walk around New York right now and um, Midtown Manhattan is, it feels like it's a, you know, the, the zombie apocalypse has hit. There's, there's no one on the street. There's no one in Times Squares. There's the pizza shops are empty. The cabs are, you can get a cab at six o'clock on Sixth Avenue now, like not even blinking. Um, so I thought that people would be more understanding of the need to leave their home because no one wants to leave their home. So, um, we felt that we wanted to make a film that try and humanize the situation so that people would understand uh, if they were faced with the same circumstances, they would probably make the same decisions. Yeah, absolutely. And touching on, of course, we're more familiar here with the war on drugs and the devastation that that has had on so many people, mass incarceration and so on. But I, I think what needs to be pointed out is, as the film points out, the demand for the drugs, it, it comes from America. Everything comes from America. So how is that war, the war on drugs and narco trafficking, the fact that what Mexico's uh, gross national product is uh, one third tied into this, how is that all tied in? How do you try to get that into the movie as well? Well, I mean, I think on the, I think that basically um, the war on drugs is, is looking at this with a military solution. And I think the only way to look at this really, if you want to provide a solution for this is to look at it economically. So if you create pressure on the supply side by making it harder to import drugs or with interdiction or assassinations of uh, extrajudicial assassinations of, of cartel leaders. Um, you're only creating more incentive for the younger drug dealers to export the product because you're creating a larger disparity in price between the two um, uh, areas between Mexico and the United States. If you really want to um, approach the issue of 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 illegal drugs, you've got to look at this economically and say, well, how do I reduce the incentive to smuggle drugs? And that means by reducing demand or changing the price point in America through legalization or semi-legalization or gradual legalization. Whatever it is, you need to turn this away from being a military and policing problem using Mexicans and Central Americans as the boogeyman that is coming to rape and murder your children. And you needed to turn it into focus on the addicts and reducing the price point in America and reducing the incentive to smuggle drugs and the, and the profits. You need to deal with that too. So that's where it all ties in is it's an economic argument, not a military argument, I feel. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, 
you also have some very, very intimate scenes of uh, the drug dealers themselves preparing their product, preparing to arm themselves for battle. And in one point, one of the fellows says, am I doing right? Am I doing wrong? I'm doing what I need to do, what I have to do. What are you trying to get across there? Well, those guys allowed us to come and film their business because they really have no uh, qualms about what they're doing. They don't think that supplying the narcotic habit of America is in any way, um, uh, pro it's not problematic to them. If it wasn't them, it would be somebody else, so it might as well be them. And the Cartel de Sinaloa, they, they, it feels like when you're with them, it's very much like the Old West. It's the, uh, it's sort of the law of the mountains and the, uh, it's an unwritten code of, of, of conduct. And um, I think they wanted to show that because they, you know, when you're with them, there's no real existential crisis for them. They, they run as fast as they can for as long as they can to make as much money as they can with the knowledge that they're going to jail or they're going to be killed. Um, so, um, you know, when we spent, you know, we spent two, three weeks with them in the mountains and, you know, we didn't eat much salad. So, you know, they're not really worried about their long-term health um, issues. Right. And the, um, the police is, are not after them either. They've been bought off the political authorities that might have something to say about this is all, they've all been bought off, right? 98% of the crimes um, that are committed in, in, in Mexico never get solved, you point out. One of the uh, uh, figures in the, in the movie points out. So we, we get a picture here of this incredible political, moral, economic chaos um, and people doing what they need to do, including people who are attempting to migrate. I mean, uh, again, one of the most important points I think you make in the, in the, in the film is that um, to migrate is to not do anything criminal. They don't see them. So this is not a criminal activity. They're doing what they need to do to survive. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think that no one wants to leave their home. And if what we were trying to do is to, to respond to the political rhetoric and really go and find out who was on the caravan and why did they leave and to humanize that to a point where people can appreciate that if they were in that situation, they would probably make the same choices because if, if you live in, in a country where the murder rate is higher than the level of COVID uh, positive um, infections per 100,000 people, I think that's a lot more threat to your existence than, than COVID is. And um, so where is the line that you draw? Because people left New York when it was only the possibility of getting infected with COVID, whereas we're talking a murder rate in Central America that's seven or eight times the level of COVID positivity per 100,000 people in New York. That's a great, great point. That really is. Um, it, but the, the level of violence also is something that is, uh, is tolerated or seen as, well, I don't want to put it, but, but in a sense, people see it as normal. You show scenes where people are having dinner outside and in outdoor cafes or whatever, and, and, and dead bodies are being taken away. And this becomes something that no one really uh, is bothered by, correct? Um, yeah, we those steps, particularly in Acapulco. Um, Acapulco is we chose Acapulco because of its a relationship as a jet setting paradise for Elizabeth Taylor and Richard Burton in the 50s and 60s. It was once a, a beautifully situated town on the Pacific coast of Mexico that has now become a cruise line and well, not even cruise line anymore, but it used to be. But you know, these poorly constructed hotels that dominate the coast and it's become, you know, a, 
a, you know, there's basically a civil war on the streets between nine or 10 gangs after Arturo Beltran was killed. And while we were there, there were 20 murders a week on the streets. Mm. And, um, and, and yeah, when the violence is at that level, it's normalized. And, uh, but people are very resilient and people continue to go about their business even though they're living in a war zone that's around them. And it's not even like there's a front line, the war is around them. It could happen at any time. And because they've lost their leaders, these nine gangs, um, they don't have the same access to the larger drugs market. So they become predatory on their own people. And once you're on the wrong side of the law, once you're part of this outlaw culture, there's very little chance that you're gonna be able to reintegrate into society. The skill set you have is extortion and, and blackmail, not selling and uh, buying. It's, it's so, um, to say that is that I don't know how you solve that problem. I don't know how you reintegrate those people into society. Um, I just, so that's the, one of the problems of Acapulco is well, what happens next. That's a really interesting point. Um, explain a little more for our audience. So as the leaders of these drug cartels are assassinated or in some way put away or whatever, Others come in and they become more desperate, more violent, more um, uh, complicit with the extortion and attacking the very own people that they, in the community. It, it, yeah, it, exactly. They don't have any, re they, they become predatory on their own community because they have no ability to export anything outside of their community to earn money. So they end up charging people rent to do business, whether it be a taxi driver or who we followed in Acapulco or a fishmonger who was murdered. Um, and, um, you know, everyone has to pay the rent. That's what they say. Yeah. Todos pagan el piso. Exactly. And how does this fit into this, this sort of structured violence and racism fit into the American political narrative that you would like to see challenged? Well, uh, I, I think that um, the political narrative has been the vilification of, of anyone of, of darker skin than the president or Mr. Stephen Miller. So we'd like to challenge the, the, the inherent uh, concept that, that Mexicans by their very nature are rapists and murderers. And I think that, um, uh, to a certain extent now, the violence in Mexico creates the wall. Mexico now is, is, is almost the wall itself. And at the, the idea of actually a physical wall is, 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 you know, is just a metaphor right now because it's not really gonna happen. So you, if, you, if you continue to allow the instability in Mexico, you're going to dissuade lots more people from coming to, uh, of, to seek refuge in America by crossing, continuing to cross one of the most violent countries in the world. And that's what about that's what it's really about, Nick. Right? It is about, as you mentioned, Steve Miller, uh, who is the is the the chief architect of, of the policy that Trump is. And by the way, as you point out in the movie too, it's not just this is hasn't just started with the Trump administration. I'd like to get into that historically a little more with you too, but. But again, this, this, the white nationalists uh, uh, led by people like Steve, uh, by uh, Steve Miller, this is what it's about. Is it creating um, the, the outsider, the, the other that can be vilified and hated and for political purposes, um, justifying the harsh, militaristic response to them, blaming the victim in a sense, and deferring us from a, a true understanding and analysis of our own role in creating these people, correct? Yeah, absolutely. The, um, the, 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 there's almost, uh, it's, it's a justification for an enormous bureaucracy and pork money grab by, um, by Washington. 
Um, you know, there's 28,000 members of the uh, CBP. Um, it's been steadily climbing for the last, you know, 20 years. And you saw how the CBP were used as a federal uh, police force in our own cities recently as well, which was, you know, shocking to see the, the border patrol policing, you know, the streets of Portland and, and, um, and other American cities. So I think that it's in, in a sense that you, with the end of the Cold War, um, the war on drugs has, has vilified the likes of, of Mexico and Central America and Colombia uh, to try and you know, create this bureaucracy that you can feed and, and exploit uh, financially. Um, so I think, that's a, I think that's something that America is not so self-aware about. And, and this goes way back. Each American president, I mean, uh, Nixon, Bush, um, uh, Clinton, um, Reagan, not just Trump, all have said this is our number one issue. This is our big concern and have maneuvered and manipulated um, counter movements to keep duly elected uh, uh, politicians, officials from leading the countries like Nicaragua and Guatemala and Honduras and so on. So the people would have um, more of a chance of, of living a decent life and not being forced to migrate, right? Well, yeah, America has consistently supported um, right-wing regimes uh, in the region um, because of the specter of, of communism and um, and socialism. I, I'm not sure why they put socialism and communism together in the same bucket. I don't see them as, as you know, dovetailing political philosophies, but um, this is where we're at right now. I don't think universal healthcare is an issue for, um, should be an issue for any country. So communist, socialist, or Republican. Um, so, you know, they need an enemy to fight. So they, you know, they have, have created one because the specter of, of China and Russia is not tangible enough for them at the moment. Right. Tell us a little more at a human level. Who did, who did you meet on, in that caravan? Who are some of the people? What are some of the stories that you saw? Um, I mean, we moved with the caravan, we saw it form, it went, there was maybe a few hundred people on the town square to suddenly over the course of two days, there's eight to 10,000 people. And, you know, we met lots of people and to a T they were hospitable and gracious and looked after us as one of them. So I remember there was one time that I was walking backwards with the camera shooting and I was about to fall into a huge pothole in the road. And this guy comes and basically tackles me from behind. And I'm like shocked because I was like, what is this? But then I saw the hole and we laughed and I was like, thank you. But like, um, so we met all sorts of people. We met families, we met unaccompanied men, we met, you know, Ludi and her unaccompanied minor friends. Um, and we just found people that were you know, fleeing the violence of their country. And that violence in their country is not solely their country's responsibility. There's been a lot of outside influences and a lot of neo-colonial and imperialistic, um, you know, policy that's, that's created you know, instability in their country, corruption, fostered corruption in their country and, and allowed violence to permeate every level of their country. And I, I think it should be emphasized, some of the people, I think what Sarah was on this journey for how many days? It was 123, I think, or? I think they were, they were already two or three months uh, on their journey when we met them in Tapachula. So they were, I think, yeah, close to 100, 150 days by the time this is all over, maybe longer. And, and with whole families and, and, and not having 
adequate yeah, no, but what Sara and Sharo did that was you know you know incredible was they turned the journey into an adventure for the children so it was like they were going on this incredible camping trip and the kids always had a ball and were playing football uh, amongst themselves they managed to bring you know just they could bring one toy with them if they were could carry it and so the, those kids were always you know whenever we saw them were always you know engaged and happy and um you know yeah you know we might have bought them some pan dulce but like you know yeah, yeah. Um, their smiles were always there there was not um there was not dark moments for them and, and yeah right and you capture that in the film and and sarah's it is telling them things will be better. This will, this will get better. And that's not unusual. That's not unusual to what um, this nation of immigrants, including my own family, I, from both sides, most of us came from other countries. And that was not, that was exactly what we thought when, when my people came and other people, of course, this is what they thought would happen. They put up with whatever the journey was because they had the hope that it was going to be better. And um, I think what we're seeing now is a meanness and a cruelty, barbarity, uh, particularly in the in the Trump administration uh, for his own political needs uh, to to squash that. American dream, if you will, in this war on immigration, war on migrants. And uh, it, it, it takes a lot of different forms. It's not just putting down caravans, right? It's it's involved in, in a wholesale restriction of people who come here, who gets to come here, how long they can stay. I, I believe uh, we, we've cut the number of people who've been here by half, who've come here by half during the, the, the Trump years. So this is an all out war. Yeah, it's a uh, it it seems to be his last political hope, hopefully. Hopefully, uh, exactly. But but it's been unfortunately one of the policies that he's been most successful with. Would you say? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that I don't know. I don't know if Trump actually has any policy, uh, but it's certainly one of the tactics that's um, that's uh, um, that's. Uh, energized his base you know so hopefully we're left with the people that vote for trump are the racists the evangelicals and the people that are so rich that and so selfish that they don't care about you know the things that make you know society better as a whole yeah i don't know if he th i don't know if he planned this i think I, I truly believe that he 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 doesn't think about anything apart from the adultation of the um of his fans and that he just says things to them that that gets a reaction and then it's not so it's not the really isn't policy it's just narcissism so to him the cruelty is the point because it his base responds to it and it, it does feed on a whole lot of people's need to be cruel in some way to to feel better then even though they may be suffering themselves in their own situation, it's, it's very common, it's a divide and conquer policy. So you may not be feeling all that wonderful about what you're doing in your life, but at least you've got, you think somebody on your side who is going to make sure these other people aren't gonna come in and, and take over whatever you have. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible that Trump has managed to convince people to vote against their own self-interests. Um, whether it's healthcare, whether it's taxation, whether it's um, you know you know economic opportunity, um, I don't. I think he's. I think he's blurred the line so much and 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 um, amplified this feeling of American exceptionalism, exceptionalism, and superiority using racism as one of his his um key drivers to that so um and when most of his base is actually blue collar white and unemployed uh not unemployed right but blue collar and white yeah i 
I remember as we're talking here, a, a very poignant story of a, the, a young woman uh, teaching, I was teaching at John Jay in my class. And we were talking about immigration issues. And she uh, asked me during class that she was going to have to be away for a couple of weeks or so. She had to go to Arizona or somewhere to, to be trained uh, to work with ICE. And she reluctantly, she got her story out to the rest of the class. And it was basically this, that she was reluctantly, this was a job that she had. She was a single mother with a, a, a couple of children and she needed a job desperately. And she was gonna be trained to deport and you know, capture, deport, interrogate uh, unauthorized uh, migrants. Even though she admitted her own family were there without proper papers. So, I mean, and she knew, she, she got that. Her own grandmother, her, her, her mother and so on would fit into the same group of people that she was then going down to Arizona and trying to keep from coming. Um, you know, that, that we all make choices in life. And um, so I think, this is something also that I think people watching your documentary have to have to also come to terms with. What are the choices they're making in perpetuating the system, whether it's economic, uh, psychological, and so on? And you, at the very end there, when you're where you're uh, showing pictures of of some of the CEOs and the bank presidents, um, you want, want to comment about that? The laundering of this drug money, I I, I can't. Imagine how these people must live at night. Right, I think they have no problem. They've reconciled their, you know, greed as their primary motivation for, for a very long time. Um, but yeah, I don't think there's any way to really stop the corruption in the region until you create real penalties for the um, American banks that are uh, accepting this, you know, huge cash. Uh, influxes um, and um, you know I think you know I think you also you've got to look at the corruption in context as well that these things are all gradual and you need to keep making movement and 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 policy to curtail the corruption because if you look at you know if you look back at the history of America and you look in the 20s and and even a little bit earlier you're not, you're not far from Tammany Hall and 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 Fiera LaGuardia like changing how New York operated. So mm -hmm. can you look at Mexico in that context and say, okay, well, in in a in a civic um, propitiousness, you know, in a in a civic corruption level, we're you know 80 years ahead of Mexico, but what we need to do is is take these small steps by, you know, first of all, creating um, areas in the country that don't have the same type of systematic corruption and, and, and showing Mexicans that this is the way to go. Because the other problem is Mexico's, a few people in Mexico and the cartels are benefiting from a moralistic prohibition of, of narcotics. And you've got to look at that in the same way that you look at prohibition of alcohol. The prohibition of alcohol made a created a criminal underclass of the Capones and Lucianos and, and Bronfmans and Kennedys. You know, there's no way you can separate Joseph Kennedy from the bootleggers. And his two sons went on to be attorney general and president. Um, so are, is El Chapo the, the Joseph Kennedy of, of Mexico or is he the Edgar Bronfman or is the Al Capone? Like is, at the moment he's the Al Capone. Yeah. Great point. Are you pleased with this film? Would you would you want it to uh, add anything at this point? I mean, I know that would be. A... I mean, I could have added a whole bunch. I could have, but it, yeah. Sebastian and I like working in the ninety-minute documentary format because we 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 put a lot of information in to films and. We challenge audiences to concentrate. This is not a film to watch casually with your kids running around. Well, definitely not with the kids running around. Um, 
but it's not one to watch with with your phone. It's designed as a you know a theatrical presentation where you concentrate on a film and you you put yourself in the shoes of the people walking the caravan. You put yourself in the shoes of a sicario for the cartel de Sinaloa. You put yourself in the shoes of a a, a mula that that drives drugs across the border and drives the cash and guns back. Um, and then we give you the history as well and puts them in context. So we could, we always love to go deeper and further, but we left so much on the floor. We left three family stories on the, on the cutting room floor. We left, you know, a, an intimate and detailed history of, you know, the Sinaloa cartel on the floor and breezed over it in six or seven minutes. We always want to do more, but we like the distilling to the, to the essence of where where we are right now. And you can see that in our last film as well about the war in Syria and Iraq, Hell on Earth, the fall of Syria and the rise of ISIS. We did a, it's a similar um, macro and micro look at the, um, uh, the war, the civil war in Syria and the war in Iraq. Just spend a couple more minutes on that. Um, I, I'm not familiar with that work. I'd like to see that. Tell us a little more about that work, that project. So, we um, we were always Sebastian and I were always fascinated by the um, organization of the Islamic State and their you know basically how they were marketing themselves. So we went back into um, the history of the the civil war in Syria and then went back further to really the American occupation of Iraq and and saw that really that was the tipping point of the instability in the Middle East and the increase in violence in the Middle East. And, and then we followed it all the way through. And then we followed a family who were in living in ISIS controlled territory. And I got a camera to them, a camera phone to them, and they filmed their life in Syria under uh, the Islamic State and their subsequent um, uh, uh, attempt to smuggle themselves out across the border into Turkey and then their second attempt to for them to cross into Europe on a rubber raft. So we follow them the whole way, all the way to, um, uh, uh, in the end, they were actually arrested and put in a detention center in Turkey. In Turkey, okay. Yeah. But we follow them all the way. So, and what, what is the name of this? Uh, it's called Hell on Earth, the Fall of Syria and the Rise of ISIS. Uh -huh. Okay, and again, America's involvement intimately um, creates more problems um, through the war in Iraq and so on. Uh, what are, what else are you working on? What's what's your next project? What are you working on now? We're working on two projects at the moment. The first is about the uh, Diamond Princess and the outbreak of COVID on the cruise ship uh, in Japan. The biggest outbreak, uh, the first and biggest outbreak at the time outside China and the first data set that was really available to scientists. Um, you know, and basically the Diamond Princess was the canary in the coal mine that we should have understood not only how COVID spread, but how people's behavior um, related to COVID because we follow four young kids on this boat and they never felt threatened by COVID and they continued to behave in the way they behaved before the um, um, uh, the virus became a pandemic. And then we're also working on a film called Inside Out about corruption in the LA Sheriff's Department, but we're telling it from the perspective of the inmates in the LA County Jail and in the prison system, as well as on the outside. So we have this incredible access to people inside the California jail system because cameras, unfortunately, are ubiquitous in the California penal system. So, so you are you do have access, yes, uh, to those cameras and um, yeah. okay, I'm a little taken. I'm surprised about that, but uh, but I, I I think your your perspective of looking at it from the people who are being victimized is is, ex is extremely important. Um, so when will these uh, projects be finished? We hope to have Diamond Princess is more advanced. Um, so we would hope to have the Diamond Princess ready 
uh, we're looking for March next year, which would be sort of the anniversary of the cruise. And um, and the Inside Out, I think, will be more towards the summer and fall. It's incredible the extent of of gangs inside the LA Sheriff's Department. It's incredible. Yeah, we've done some shows on that. I hope that you, uh, we, we still have a few more minutes, but I hope you'll come back uh, and uh, I'd love to. I'd be delighted. That, that, that would be wonderful. Um, when can um, our audience view um, Blood on the Walls? It's on the National Geographic app at the moment and it's got various screenings coming up on the Linear channel, but... Um, and then it will be on Hulu in about three months. Okay. All right. It's so on the National Geographic app at the moment or on your uh, on demand. Okay. Okay. A um, couple of final thoughts. Um, what do you, what do you hope to accomplish? What, what, what do you hope to accomplish with the sort of narratives you're trying to bring forth here? What generally as a body of work, yeah, as a body of work, as as a way of changing the narrative that that what well, we'd like people to understand, you know, the behavior of of governments more in context. I think people see the results of policy and government action in microbytes on the news. So they say, "Oh, well, this happened, and this happened, and this happened, and this happened," but that's only the effect. You never get to the cause on the news, and you never get to see any type of uh, linkage between the various events. So when you, what we like to do is take these little micro events that people have been following and put them in context. So to create a more poignant and, and detailed argument. And I think that people need to be more skeptical about what they read and hear, even from major news organizations. There's a big problem with major news organizations at the moment because the the metric for news now is how much advertising you sell, not how right you are, uh, not how um, honest you are. But, you know, so editors now have preconceived ideas about certain uh, news stuff and they send their journalists out to, 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 you know, to support these ideas. And in the end, they frankenbite their, um, their arguments together to, you know, to, and take people out of context um, just to create this, uh, uh, immer you know, exciting piece of film for the news cycle rather than really looking for the truth. To titillate and to make money, to brand and to market in a yeah. way. Yeah. Well, um, Nick, thank you so very much. Your work is... Uh, and I'm sorry we couldn't get your co-director on, so we next time around. Next time. Sebastian's writing a book. It's a very interesting book about um, why humans are the only species where the largest examples of the male don't prevail. Listen, I please come back. I promise I would I'd love to to do another sh couple of shows with you and, and Sebastian on what you've been writing, the next productions. And uh, one more time. You can view this on the National Ge Blood on the Wall can be viewed on the National Geographic apps and there'll be viewings in the next few weeks, correct? Yes, absolutely. Okay, terrific. Thank you for your work. Thanks, it's, Jim. it's really, really important. And, and thank you so very much for being here. Thank you for having me. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care. Thank you again very, very much. Uh, all of you who've watched us on the Radical Imagination, and we'll see you again. This is Jim Freddos, and we'll see you again next week on the Radical Imagination. The crops are all in and the peaches are rotting. The oranges are piled Soaked dumps. You're flying them back to the Mexican border. It takes all their money to wait back again. Goodbye to my one goodbye, Rosalita. Adios.
Adiós mis amigos Jesús y María You won't have a name when you ride the big airplane All they will call you will be deportee My father's own father, he waded that river. They took all the money he made in his life. My sisters and brothers, come work in the fruit fields. Rode that truck till they went down and died. Some of us are illegal. Others not wanted Our work contracts out And we have to move on Six hundred miles To that Mexican 